Hey, this is Kaz, and this is Nightmares at Midnight. Do I look abominable to you? We all go a little mad sometimes. guys welcome back to nightmares at midnight podcast like i said i'm kez we're gonna continue with our 50 states series today in just a minute we're gonna go ahead and roll and find out which one but i just want to say a couple things first please do not mind the humming in the background it is negative 27 outside here today so the pod lab is a little bit chilly so i have the heater going because my heat in the house is not keeping up with it enough So, uh, just don't mind the humming in the background. I'll try to minimize it when I edit as much as possible. Also, make sure you jump over to YouTube. We are on there now. We have a channel. Our videos get transcribed by YouTube, so kind of look the other way when there's words that are in the captions that aren't actually what I'm saying. I'm sure YouTube does its best. Other than that, keep listening on the platform that you choose to listen on. Or you can jump over to our website, which is Nightmares at Midnight Podcast.buzzsprout.com, and you can just select right there from our episodes and pick, you know, which ones. There's ones all the way back from first season on there. We right now are on Spotify, Google Podcast, Podcast Index, Amazon Music, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, Deezer, iHeartRadio, and Uh, We are submitted into Apple Podcasts. Right now, Apple Podcasts is doing this thing where it's transcribing all of your episodes if you're a podcast, a part of Apple Podcasts. So uh, it's like in withholding right now, I guess. I don't know. I got an email about it. So the other ones were like active on on there though. So I'm going to go ahead and roll. Okay, today's state is Michigan. The next episode, my husband will be on there and we're going to roll and see which episode we get for him. But today is Michigan. Just west of Detroit, Michigan is a building that is truly terrifying. Although named after a little girl, the asylum is anything but cute or innocent. The psychiatric hospital is a large complex located in Westland, Michigan. In 1913, There were three divisions, the Eloise Hospital, which was the mental hospital, the Eloise Infirmary, and the Eloise Sanitarium, which commonly housed residents with tuberculosis. So in case you are unaware of what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Eloise Asylum. In its prime, Eloise consisted of 78 buildings in 902 acres with 10,000 patients along with 2,000 staff. That's a lot of people. It was the largest psychiatric facility in the U.S., only five of the 78 buildings and the Eloise Cemetery remain. The firehouse, the power plant, the commissary, and D buildings still stand as of July 2023. One specific area that we're going to talk about is the main building on the lot. It was built in 1931, but it wasn't open to the public until 1932. This one was the intake building. So every patient after 1932 had to come through those doors labeled Eloise across the top, which I've seen several pictures of. I've seen several interviews done, and they sit in front of those doors. Very spooky. They got red lights behind the name, so it just looks really scary right out the gate. So the people would come through those doors, get evaluated, and then dispersed to other buildings depending on their diagnosis. There were many different hospitals on the property, but this was the building that determined where they needed to go. Some people came there just being homeless, others came due to actually needing mental help. 
The name, this part I think is kind of funny, honestly. The name came about when the property was trying to get its own postal code. That's how huge this place is. But every name they submitted to the postmaster got denied. Until it hit them to use Eloise. The name of the daughter of the postmaster they were submitting the names to, Freeman B. Dickerson, was Eloise. And of course, he couldn't deny that, could he? In this specific building alone, they had many different types of therapies. They had insulin therapy, hydrotherapy, electric shock therapy, lobotomies. They did have some good therapies, like recreational therapy, uh, where there was dancing in one of the buildings. They had botanical therapy, which if you know what that is, it's kind of taking care of plants. And then Eloise was also the very first location in the country to do music therapy. So that's pretty cool. I know a lot of the history and stories about Eloise are always really creepy. And I just wanted to add that there is some positive vibe to this as well sometimes. But you came to hear my podcast, which means you don't want to hear the positives. You want to hear the scary stuff. Here we go. There is one confirmed murder in the Eloise building, Omar West. He was murdered by a man named Milo. Based off of records, Omar had been beaten and his injuries are what killed him. There were many suicides that happened here. A woman named Kate Westgate died by drinking a jug of toxic soapy water. What a way to go. Several women are documented hanging themselves and many people are documented having leapt from the third floor. That sounds awful. I I can't handle heights to begin with, but then to choose that way to go, just no thank you. Uh, There's a man that slit his throat, another man, which this one I've heard several accounts of, another man boiled himself to death in one of the hydrotherapy tubs. This one I find peculiar, kind of, because although a lot of people were committing suicide, could there not have been people dying from abuse from staff? Like, what if this guy was in the tub, which I think they got strapped down into, maybe, and couldn't get out? Based off of the pictures that I saw, a lot of the people would sit in tubs and they had this, like, white sheet thing all the way around the top of the tub, and it, like, went around by their neck. So all you could see is their head. So what if this guy was in there, and the staff came in and turned only the hot water on, and he couldn't get out, so he died? And then would the staff say it was them? No, because that would be murder then versus suicide. The third floor seems to be the most active for paranormal. Reading multiple articles and I've watched a bunch of videos, interviews, and ghost hunters going in. If you stand at the top of the stairs, a lot of the time you can hear voices or heels clicking like from nurses in that time era uh, when they would wear the high heels and just overall a lot more talking on that floor. The fifth floor was dedicated to the criminally insane men, where you get a lot of vulgar words and name calling at you. The fourth floor was noted as the doctor's bathtub area, where there is a spirit that comes across as a doctor and is documented as more violent and more angry. One of the groups that I watched that was doing this, they had used some equipment, and I definitely want to get more knowledgeable with this stuff. Uh, They had used a specific piece of equipment to where they could hear the voice coming through and it clearly was way more vulgar. Like I said, I watched several of the videos and uh, one of the groups was called Blood Moon Paranormal. They are also on YouTube, so you should go check them out. No, I'm not affiliated. I just watched their videos and I mean, they're pretty good if you like the EVP stuff. One of the guys in the group is Zach and he has been working on multicolor tests. I'm sure there's way more scientific stuff that I don't understand that he could explain it to you, but it's basically seeing if it's easier to see spirits while different colors are shining in the room. That's what I gathered from it. In the video, he started with red for a couple minutes and then green and then blue. And like he's standing in the room with these lights on, that these colored lights on. I think it was really interesting to see the instruments that they use. Uh, some of them are like a tri-field meter, flashlights. I've seen with multiple EVP hunters, they use cat balls. My favorite that they use is the EMF trip wires. It's like a line of balls that are all connected and they're bluish to start with. And then they turn red or green if an energy is touching them or standing close, that kind of thing. I've seen these used in multiple experiments dealing with the paranormal. And I just think those ones like give me the chills the most. The Asylum inspired the horror movie Eloise. Uh, That came out February 3rd, 2017. 
a famous person who was there was inventor Elijah McCoy. Elijah was a Canadian-American engineer of African-American descent who invented lubrication systems for steam engines. Um, And he's known to kind of have made an appearance in some of the EVPs as well. Then, I don't know if any of you guys know who Jimmy Hoffa is. I didn't until I started doing research. But he was the man who served as the president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Uh, He went missing about 40 minutes away from Eloise, a little bit south. And while watching a few encounters at Eloise, it's believed that either Hoffa himself or someone who potentially killed him might be left roaming the halls. While I was watching some of the videos, you can hear over these instruments that they use, people saying Hoffa, and so that you know, they're connecting that it's either him or, you know, somebody who knew what was going on when he disappeared. Many local groups, including the Friends of Eloise, have spent years working to preserve the history of the facility, including the ongoing efforts to identify several thousand patients who were discovered in a nearby burial ground. So what actually got me trying to figure out about Eloise is a friend of mine sent me a video about these hunters, I guess, EVP ghost hunter type deal discovering this burial ground with all of these graves and they were on the grounds of Eloise and so I was like wow if that many bodies are there I can only imagine the spirits and EVP stuff that happens there and then I literally have spent two weeks even over last week's episode trying to research more about Eloise so I feel like I know a little bit about it at least while researching I also stumbled upon a website that had several black and white photos of life at Eloise. In the photos, it doesn't look too terrible, but then again, who would photograph staff hurting patients or patients committing suicide? Unless it's recording further science, like lobotomies, right? We've all seen those pictures of the early 1900s of people getting lobotomies done and how they thought they were advancing science so much, but they weren't really. I included the website in the show notes so that way you can see the pictures from that time era as well. Okay, moving on from paranormal to cryptids because we all know we love a good cryptid. We now have the sixth state that has reports of Bigfoot. Go figure. This one was shown on Animal Planet based off of a trail camera that a hunter had set out to view the game that had been walking through his property. I watched the trail cam video and actually saw the pictures like they still frame it. And it does look like a Bigfoot in the background walking through and standing. But this one, I almost feel like it could be debunked. I know in Michigan there is bears, but based off the photo, which I did link this one in the show notes as well. With the quickness between the trail cam taken pics, which it takes them a minute apart. The creature was in one and not the one before or after. So it came in. It saw the deer that is also in the photo and then moved on. So this trail cam is pointed at like, I think it's like a salt lick or I don't know, you you hunters probably know what I'm talking about. Um, it's like a stump that has stuff in it to attract deer to see what kind of deer come through the trail. Anyways, there's a deer close up, like you get the back end shot of a deer right by the stump. And then in the background, you can see this creature something shadow something that it looks like it could be bigfoot or a larger man but in the video with animal planet the guy goes on to explain that you know he's got acres and acres of hunting land and so nobody would be walking through there i don't know that i believe this one is really bigfoot but i mean if it's the sixth state that has it that just that we've talked about I feel like we've got to be getting more real and real with Bigfoot, right? Another monster, per se, in Michigan is called Pressy, known as the Monster of Lake Superior. Pressy got her name from sightings that occurred near the Presque Isle River. The creature is said to have a serpent's body, a horse-type head, the tail of a whale, long neck, blackish-green, and about 75 feet long. Wow. It's dated back to 1894, including reports of its back sticking six to eight feet above water, a 15-foot neck, a foot-wide jaw, it chasing ships, and a man fell overboard and was grabbed and constricted like a snake. 
and that it can swim around nine miles an hour and seem to have multiple humps. So I feel like on those like early 1600 maps where they painted the water creatures on them, I feel like this one would be one of those on there. I, uh, I have a fear of deep water and probably will never go on a cruise. So uh, this part of the episode definitely doesn't help that. Um, as recently as the 1990s, which is my birth year, witnesses at Point Iroquois claim to have seen a buck deer being pulled into the water by a large underwater beast, which only left the head of the buck on shore. So whatever it is, clearly doesn't like brains. Yes, that was a joke. What do you think it could be? A giant water snake? A barracuda? A freshwater octopus? A dinosaur descendant, maybe? Pike? Sturgeon? A giant eel? Or completely made up? Let's face it, Lake Superior is massive, and the existence of some unknown underwater creature is extremely possible. But until someone can take a decent, unblurred picture of or video of this creature, we'll just have to sit and speculate, won't we? Other Michigan lake creatures that are heard of are the Lake Leelanau monster, the sea monster of the Mackinac Straits, and Saggy, the Saginaw Bay Beast. As far as other Michigan cryptids, there is the Red Dwarf of Detroit that I covered in Season 1, Episode 8, which feels like forever ago when I look back at how the sound is in that episode. There is also the Michigan Dogman. The Michigan Dogman was a creature allegedly witnessed in 1887 in Wexford County, Michigan. It was described as a 7-foot-tall, blue-eyed or amber-eyed, bipedal canine-like animal with the torso of a man and a fearsome howl that sounds like a human scream. According to legends, the Michigan Dogman appears in a 10-year cycle that falls on years ending in seven, oddly specific. Sightings have been reported in several locations throughout Michigan, primarily in the northwestern quadrant of the Lower Peninsula. Apparently, two lumberjacks saw a creature which they described as having a man's body and a dog's head. This is where it gets good. In 1987, disc jockey Steve Cook at WTCM-FM in Traverse City, Michigan, recorded a song titled The Legend, which he initially played as an April Fool's Day joke, and he based the songs on myths and legends from around North America and had never heard of an actual Michigan dogman at the time of the recording. He recorded the song with a keyboard backing and credited it to Bob Farley. After he played the song, Cook received calls from listeners who said that they had encountered a similar creature. In the next weeks, after Cook first played the song, it was the most requested song on the station. He also sold cassettes of the songs for $4 and donated proceeds from the single to an animal shelter. So that tells you what time era that was, 1987. I hope majority of my listeners at least know what a cassette tape is. Over the years, Cook has received more than 100 reports of the creature's existence. In March 2010, the creature was featured in an episode of Monster Quest. In January 2017, the creature was featured in the Season 2 episode Great Lakes Wolfman Dogman Wendigo of Monsters and Mysteries in America. Cook later added verses to the song in 1997 after hearing a report of an animal break-in by an unknown canine at a cabin in Luther, Michigan. He re-recorded it again in 2007 with a mandolin backing. Uh, because of copyright, I can't play it for you, but I've attached it in the show notes so you can just go listen yourself if you'd like. Anyway, this one reminds me of its sister cryptid, the Beast of Bray Road, which I also covered that one on one of the earlier episodes. I think it was episode two that you can go back and listen to if you'd like from Wisconsin. History Channel did a top 10 list of disturbing dogman sightings of the American Midwest. Five out of the 10 are in Michigan, four in Wisconsin, and one in Minnesota. Yeah, that sounds like a place that I just can't wait to move back to because, you know, dogman. Switching from Dogman to somewhere I've actually been and seen, pay attention to that and seen, way up there in the UP by the Wisconsin border, which 
actually I'm going to pause. I said way up there in the UP. I'm above the UP, but I'm like to the West far. But if you're in Wisconsin, it's way up there. Is a teensy tiny town of Paulding and off a less beaten path, off an even more or less beaten path is a valley. And if you look down a line of power poles at night, you'll see a white light off in the distance floating right towards you. Legend says it's a will-o'-the-wisp, an atmospheric ghost light that resembles a lantern. It could be the ghost of a railroad brakeman killed on the tracks, if you believe local folklore, or it could be the ghost of a Native American dancing on the power lines. Reports of the light have appeared since the 1960s. The first record sighting was in 1966, when a group of teenagers reported the light to a local sheriff. Since then, a number of other individuals have reported seeing the light, which is said to appear nearly every night at the site. Although stories related to the light vary, the most popular legend involves the death of a railroad brakeman. The legend states that the valley once contained railroad tracks and the light is the lantern of the brakeman who was killed while attempting to stop an oncoming train from colliding with railway cars stopped on the tracks. This is the story that I had heard originally before I went out there. So I hadn't heard of the other ones yet at that time. I I haven't been out there, gosh, since uh, 2013, maybe? 2014? That was when last time I went out. Another story claims that the light is the ghost of a slain mail courier, while another says that it is the ghost of a Native American. And according to John Carlyle of the Detroit Free Press, one legend is that it is a grandparent looking for a lost grandchild with a lantern that needs constant relighting, which is the reason that the light seems to come and go. I have never heard of that one, so that one's new to me. Eventually, the scientists came along to explain away all the fun. In 2010, Michigan Tech University Electrical Engineering PhD candidate Jeremy Boss led a student expedition. Equipped with everything from cameras to light meters to high power telescopes, their sole mission was explaining the Paulding light with supporting proof. Sounds like a bunch of fun at parties. They came away with empirical evidence of what many less fanciful Paulding visitors already expected its cars. Distant headlights combining with atmospheric effects to create a shimmering mirage. Boss earned that PhD and is now an associate professor in Michigan Tech's electrical and computer engineering department. Despite his team's efforts to offer the community a clear cause of the sightings, the legends persist. I ask people who saw the light what they saw and what they think they saw, Boss said. If they ask me to explain, I do. Most people say they see yellowish or red lights that appear to move. If there is some motion, most of what they are seeing is due to an autokinetic effect. I use similar explanations for mirages and hot roads in the summer. Listen, Mr. Boss, you're taking away all of our fun believing that it's a ghost if you scientific it out. I understand that some people live to like debunk the extraterrestrial and the ghosts and the spirits i understand that people try to understand what's happening so they science a way into it but let me tell you i've been out there i've seen this one the vibe that you get and you are way out in the boonies in the woods and the trees like it's not just a side of the highway situation it's just crazy because it really feels like that light is coming towards you like you're looking down a valley and this thing moves So I don't think it's cars, but I guess I'm not a scientist with a PhD. So Mr. Boss urges inquisitive ghost hunters to look through a telescope or a telephoto lens, assuring them that they will see car headlights and brake lights. Regardless, there remain visitors who simply want to believe and won't be convinced they didn't see the impossible. That's me. To those that don't spend their lives thinking about the interaction between light and air, a ghost story is just more interesting. You can combine that with the local people wanting this place, an area most people ignore, to be special because they think it really is special. I don't know that I think it's special. I just really do believe that this is one of those places that energy is. Cindy Perkins, a Michigan-based senior content specialist, believes that the MTU explanation, but 
visits the site with her daughter for an occasional evening's entertainment. She suggests that there are now as many travelers at the site looking to test the scientific explanation as there are devotees to the various supernatural causes. While researching, I came across a poem about the Paulding Light, which this was interesting for me, of course, which is, it's really written differently than I've seen poems before, but I really enjoy it. It's called Multiple Choice for a Drift Michigander by Brian Sizik, and he uploaded it to the Poetry Foundation website in February of 2022 to show how recent this poem was. I'm going to read this to you. How can one see the Paulding light? A. You must arrive at the dead end of old US-45 at midnight with a heart half empty and a tank half full. There must be no stars in the sky. There must be no snow in the car. Let every regret surface. Grow feverish and weep. List every positive outcome your choices revoked. This is how you call the light. You will catch it in the rearview mirror. B. Wait for the windshield to fog. Okay, this is, I have to pause because I can't get through this sentence. It's uh, explicit, so if you're a child listening, cover your ears. Wait for the windshield to fog. Bellow opera or fuck or bend close and breathe on the glass to speed its misting. Then use a finger to smudge out a triangle through which to see with your better eye. Light can only enter where dark is erased. C. First, believe repetition is the best aid to memorization. Second, believe time erases memory. Understand this is why spirits linger. Third, trust your eyes over any other part of your body. Understanding the light is trying to burn these lessons into your marrow. D. You must drive with no intention of stopping. Be your most unshakable self. Crest, still on your breath after work and coffee, cotton pillowcases and a beloved at-home waiting, no rattle of loose change on the dashboard. The light arrives like God when you beg it not to. I also included the website if you'd like to read the poem in the show notes. So yeah, there is quite a few other cryptids in Michigan. Those are the main ones that I've covered. I really spent a lot of time researching the Eloise Asylum, so I'm sure if you guys want to hear more about that, we can delve into that. But I think we're going to keep it a little bit shorter this week, and then that way we can jump right into next week with William. So hope you guys look forward to doing that. Don't forget to check us out on Instagram and Facebook, and let us know what you think of the episodes. Thanks for listening, and as always, catch us next time.